Hi friends, welcome back to another episode of Generation Tech. My name is Alan. If you guys have a minute, check us out on Facebook. It's where we usually upload our videos in case your notifications on YouTube aren't working. Also, you get to see what we're usually doing when we're not doing this, like what books we're reading, what video games we're playing, and what kind of animals or species we're trying to eat. I know a lot of you guys would jump at the opportunity to join Master Emperor Palpy McScrotum Face's Stormtrooper Corps. It's an easy sell. You get the cool Stormtrooper armor, blasters, and unless you're facing Rebel heroes, you're most likely going to be running around kicking Rebels in the face and stomping down degenerate aliens trying to corrupt the virtue of young human women. Or at least that's what they want you to see in the hollow dramas. The reality is, like all jobs, being a Stormtrooper has its fair share of repetitive tasks along with moments of devastating boredom. And so today we're going to be looking at what a day in a Stormtrooper's shoes is actually like. And today's episode is brought to you by Raid Shadow Legends. A turn-based RPG that's been nominated for Google Play's Best Choice of 2019 User's Choice Award. Raid Shadow Legends is centered around creating an elite squad of warriors from a roster of 400 champions. Plus, 16 new champions will be added every month, so there's all these new strategies you can try. I personally recommend you only stick with the human champions, that way you're not betraying your species. But there are orcs, undead, and elves as well. Lead your team through a fully voiced story campaign and get extra progression awards each mission. Once you complete the full campaign, you get to unlock the best champion, the legendary Arbiter. Full disclosure, she is a high elf. She's hiding her pointy ears behind that helmet. It is a little misleading. But that's fine because she basically pawns everyone in PvP. Down below in the description, we have a special link to Raid Shadow Legends that will give you an additional 50,000 silver and an epic champion when you start the game. Okay, cool. So, Stormtroopers were originally designed to be used as specialized shock troops. During the earlier days of the Empire, they were used mainly in operations against the remaining Separatist holdouts. Due to the massive size of the Empire, the majority of troops stationed in the Empire's many worlds and outposts were either local militia or Imperial Army. These type of units were much cheaper to maintain and easier to train. But in the latter years of the Empire, especially after the Battle of Yavin and the destruction of the Death Star, Emperor Palpatine increased the size of the Stormtrooper Corps to deal with the growing threat that was the Alliance to restore the Republic. This decreased the quantity and training of the Corps, and we began seeing more and more Stormtroopers being deployed as garrison forces. The life of a garrison Stormtrooper was not a glorious one. Thar Niende was a part of the 97th Legion, and she was stationed in the city of Pinyum on the planet of Solus. Solus was a volcanically active planet located in the Outer Rim. Mining was its major industry. As a matter of fact, the city of Pinyum was located in the cavern of an enormous cave system and was as shockingly beautiful as it was gritty and industrial. SP-475 was luckier than most individuals. She was actually deployed on her home world in her home city. That meant when she was off duty, she had a place to stay outside the barracks and she could see her uncle who owned a local cantina. It had been a rough year for the miners of Solus. The mid-rim offensive by the Rebellion had shocked the galaxy. And even though the Rebels were finally repelled and now in full retreat, the Empire was still increasing mining quotas and desperately trying to replace all the destroyed war material. In better times, SP-475 would have gone out with friends to a tap cafe or maybe to go see a holodrama at a local theater. But now, during these tough times, she bought medical supplies and rations with her own salary to the local cantina where her uncle would distribute it to miners who were not only underpaid but also working in hazardous environments without any medical coverage. SP-475 was your typical good Imperial. She could clearly see the economic hardships all around her. But she mostly blamed it on the rebels and the increasing unrest their movement was causing amongst the civilian populace. At the cantina, she felt uneasy after hearing some of her uncle's friends talk about the Cobalt Laborers Reformation Front, which was an anti-imperial organization led by the Solistan named Nian Numb. Perhaps on the peripherals of her subconscious, she understood that her own empire was a part of the problem, but still, she tried her best to be a loyal member of the Stormtrooper Corps. SP-475 shift of the 97th Legion was oftentimes at sundown. The Imperial complex on Solust would have probably looked quite similar to the one we saw in Lothal. A group of large prefabricated durasteel buildings that were bland and utilitarian and did not attempt to adjust to the local culture or architecture. 
It would have stuck out like some giant monstrosity on a greener world, but here on Solus, its sleek and industrial lines made it fit in very well with the rest of the city. The building was surrounded by mechanical eyes that checked out all of the identities of people walking by. There were several checkpoints that SP-475 had to pass through and show identification before she could actually reach her barracks where her locker was with all of her equipment. When SP-475 puts on her armor, we get some insight on why the armor is designed the way it is. First, she puts on the black body glove. It's made out of a tough material that was designed to absorb the thermal energy of a blaster round. It also could regulate body temperature. Then she would put on her synth leather boots. Out of habit, she always made sure to put her left one first and then her right. Then she would snap on the plastoid greaves onto her legs. Once they made contact with the right point, a mechanical click and world could be heard, signaling that she had done it properly. Then the belt and crotch plates would come on followed by the chest plate and shoulder plates, arms and gloves. They were all perfectly molded to her body shape. The Empire didn't give any special treatment to women who were trying out for the Stormtrooper Corps. They had to meet the same high standards as the men, so Thar would have most likely been one of the very few women in her unit. While putting on all of this armor would have been very difficult for an uninitiated Stormtrooper, these troopers were expected to hop in all of their gear and be combat ready in under a minute. The final step for Thar was to grab her helmet, which had to be clicked in place before the lenses depolarized and the computer system turned on and activated the HUD along with a camera and microphone that recorded everything she did. Stormtroopers could be punished for taking off their helmets during a patrol or for having excessive chatter. After each shift, she would return her helmet to her locker and the recordings would be downloaded by the local Imperial Security Bureau branch for analysis. SB-475 really enjoyed putting her armor on. It was almost like a relaxing ritual in which she could throw away her identity as Thar Niende of Solus and become one of the many faceless stormtroopers representing the might of the Empire. Although she was only one individual, she suddenly felt like she had the power of the entire Empire behind her as she walked the streets. When she was walking around the streets unarmored, she felt naked and alone. And that's because a lot of people already knew that she was a part of the Stormtrooper Corps and anti-Imperial sentiment was definitely brewing on her homeworld. After suiting up, SP-475 and the rest of her unit would report for briefing and inspections. When Thara had joined the Stormtrooper Corps a year earlier, she used to really dread these daily inspections. Any minor scuff or wrinkle on her armor or uniform would be called out, and she always took this personally until one day she realized that the reason these inspections were made was so that every individual could look the same so that no one could be singled out. It wasn't personal at all, but an attempt to make sure everyone was on the same page and functioned like a unit. After the daily inspection, the lieutenant would go over the briefing which usually included any extra security requests because of some event or visiting dignitaries, along with a dossier on any wanted individuals or organizations, like the Cobalt Front and their leader, Nian Numb. The 97th Legion at the time was carrying out anti-insurgent operations against the local resistance movement, which was trying to link up with the wider rebellion. At the end of each one of these briefings, the lieutenant would usually have some kind of uh, PowerPoint or the Star Wars equivalent of a PowerPoint which would show different type of maps and photos of the individuals that are suspected terrorists. This would be followed by patrol assignments for each Stormtrooper squad across the city, but in some rare cases, a larger attack by either rebel forces or bandits could escalate the alert level of the entire base. Which is exactly what happened when the Rebellion's 61st Mobile Infantry attacked Solus and took over control of Inusu Tor Mineral Processing Facility, which overlooked Pinyum. It was an extremely important facility that actually was built into an active volcano, which they used to power their forgers and smelters. The 61st Mobile Infantry's plan was to use the lava in the volcano to destroy the facility. In response, the garrison was deployed and the most skilled members of the 97th Legion were sent to guard the mineral processing facility, which by this point was pretty much a mountain fortress already, complete with bunkers, gun emplacements, anti-aircraft batteries, and the works. SP-475, who was a newbie, was assigned to lock down the city of Pyenyum. This usually involved closing down certain streets and directing all the traffic flow to special checkpoints and also conducting random searches on civilians. She would continue to get live updates and also orders on her HUD inside of her helmet as the day went on. As tensions ramped up, she received the authorization to detain anyone who she thought was suspicious. 
Then she started receiving warrants from the ISB to raid suspicious individuals' homes. She would have been signed a small squad to work with throughout the entire day. It wasn't always necessarily the same individuals every time, and although she had some familiarity with most of the stormtroopers she worked with, she didn't even know their names. And that was partly because she couldn't really chat with each other or talk about non-mission related things while on duty. This was done to further reinforce the idea that every stormtrooper was the same and that no matter who was in your squad, you were expected to function and operate in the same way. These were interchangeable pieces in a large, well-oiled machine. As things got worse, SP-475 found herself basically running around the city all day and all night with very little rest. The Empire continued cracking down on the civilian populace, kicking people out of their homes, shutting down the infrastructure and hollow net, and making it incredibly hard for anyone to move around the city and even communicate with one another. SP-475 had reported the individuals in her uncle's cantina to her local ISB officer, which led to her getting a commendation, but also led to her uncle getting locked up. But she didn't have any time to dwell on it because her focus, like all the other stormtroopers, would be on the rebels who were now besieged at the refinery. Stormtroopers need to be vigilant because a rebel fighter would shoot on sight with no hesitation if they saw her. As the situation began deteriorating all across the galaxy, like it did on Solast, the Empire would begin relaxing its day-to-day -day requirements, minor scuffs on the uniform were okay during wartime, and the Security Bureau would have had their hands full interrogating civilians, and probably wouldn't have enough time to look at a Stormtrooper's helmet readings. On more isolated worlds like Tatooine, where resupply and logistics were spread thin, the Stormtrooper's equipment would begin to fail, and sensitive components like the built-in climate change were usually the first to go. As their speeders broke down, they would be forced to ride dewbacks instead of machines. Now the situation that we talked about today is just one of many. You could also be deployed on a beautiful world like Scarif where every moment off duty is a vacation. Or you could be deployed on a Star Destroyer patrolling the outer rim facing unknown dangers. Or you could be on Corellia, a dirty industrial world doing the same thing as Thara was on Solast. So if you could put up with all the rules and the regulations and uh, the mundane repetitive tasks you had to do on a daily basis, spliced in with moments, small moments of fear and combat and violence, while well, you're looking at a job that pays better than most jobs in the galaxy. So this was actually a pretty decent profession. But let me know in the comment section down below what you think about this job. Would you do it or would you like me try to become a contractor, or, aka smuggler, and just kind of do your own thing? Well guys, don't forget to subscribe and hit that notification button so you don't miss out on the rest of our awesome content. Also, a special thanks again to Raid Shadow Legends for sponsoring our video. And as usual, thanks for joining us today. If you're watching this, you are Generation Tech.